All right, you can turn with me uh, this morning to Philippians in chapter 1. We'll be in Philippians in chapter 1 uh, this morning, and we want to look at verses 27 through 30. Thought we'd take a little bit of a break from our study in John's Gospel and be encouraged this morning as we embark on a new year together to conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel. So Philippians in chapter 1 and beginning in verse 27. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Father, we pray for grace now. We ask that um, as a congregation that you would redouble our minds even now on conducting ourselves worthy of the gospel. Help us, Lord, as a congregation as we uh, seek to stand together and even strive together for the faith of the gospel. Help us, Lord, be faithful to our divine calling. We pray, Lord, that as we walk through this passage together, that your spirit would illuminate and give wisdom and knowledge and understanding. Bless us, we pray in this. We ask in Christ's name, amen. So I love this letter. Um, I bet you do too. In fact, I bet there are some of you that this is your, your favorite book in the Bible, the book of Philippians. And, you know, it really was a very faithful congregation. Um, Paul doesn't have a lot by way of, of uh, really correction in the book of Philippians. Um, they were, in some quarters, dealing with, uh, you know, encroaching false teachers that Paul called the enemies of the cross. Um, they, he also saw, I think, kind of coming down the pike is some, you know, encroaching apathy that uh, I suppose all congregations have to be on guard against. But as a whole, the book of Philippians is a, an entirely encouraging book. You can tell it's a very special church to Paul. He loves them, speaks highly of them, and simply wants to encourage them. They are a very, you know, a very, very strong church. But he does encourage them now to, as a congregation, he, he calls on this church to redouble their spiritual commitment to Christ and to continue to behave in a way that is consistent with the power of the gospel. And this is a good word for us too, especially as we walk into a new year together, that we would encourage each other to conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel and we just want to remind ourselves of some very basic things that we all know are true, but it's good to be reminded of that you can't do that without God's power, right? In other words, Paul's not telling church, be something you're not, right? He's telling them to be what you really are. You have been saved by the power of God. Now, we're not called to live in the power of the flesh, but by the power of the Holy Spirit who dwells every believer, we are to conduct ourselves worthy of the gospel. That's the motivation. That's where I wanted to start at. It's very, very easy to see. This will be very, probably a very short sermon and a very simple sermon, but it's very easy to see. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. You see, first of all, the motivation. What's the motivation? Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. The gospel is that underlying motivation, that gospel, the good news that we could never do ourselves is what God has done for us through Christ. That Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He lived for us. He died for us. He rose again from the grave. And therefore, we are to conduct ourselves 
worthy of the gospel. That is the underlying motivation. And as you see, it's not out of fear of the Apostle Paul or any other you know, teacher or leader. He says, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit. That underlying motivation congregation as we walk into a new year and seek to live godly in Christ Jesus is a gospel motivation. It's because of all that Christ Jesus has done for us. And you see Paul saying this emphatically, don't you? Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. Paul is really making it very clear that is the underlying motivation of our life. Everything that we see, everything that we do, it's all for the glory of God. Now, he also calls us to do this not just emphatically, but consistently. Conduct yourself worthy of the gospel. Now, church family, you know this, that the church is a great testimony to the world of the power of God. So when the unsaved looks at the church and we don't live very consistently with our calling, you know, a lack of purity, a lack of holiness, a lack of unity, et cetera, et cetera, those things are a distortion. And so we are called to be Consistent, only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So the point here is very simple, right? Those who believe the gospel should demonstrate that power by their changed life. Now, the word conduct here is in the present tense. In other words, this is, um, you know, constantly, something that we are constantly called to uh, carry out. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel. It is in the present tense. And um, it is, obviously, a command, so something that we are to really guard and make sure our life is on track with. Now, Paul gives us three characteristics of believers who live worthy of the gospel. First characteristic is that we are to stand firm. He says, continuing on in verse 27, that I may hear of your affairs that you stand, stand fast or stand firm in one spirit, with one mind. Now, to stand firm here is, um, it's like a military word, right? So the word picture here is of soldiers who've got their arms kind of locked together and they formed a unit. They're on guard together. It is a picture, as far as it translates to the church, of being on the same page, right? Of, of spiritual unity. Of a people who are on the same page together. And we recognize that we face um, common threats and common enemies. So the picture here in the church is we're all in lockstep, we're all standing together, we're of one mind, not people going in different directions with different agendas, but a united people. And second of all, that we are called to strive together. It's easy to see with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel. And again, it's just another picture. This is more of an athletic term, like a, a team. And again, they're all on the same team and all moving and working together. Now, the Church of Jesus does this um, as we all have different gifts and, and uh, different ways we express those gifts, but we work together to use those gifts to build up the body together. So it's a picture of, uh, of that kind of unity. And it's also a picture of sacrificing, you know, for the welfare of the team. So we're called to stand firm together. We are called to strive together, striving against uh, sin and temptation. And that's how the church is to play, to play as a team, to all move in the same direction with the, again, with the agenda or the goal of gospel advance, to advance God's truth. This is the, uh, uh, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. By the way, the faith of the gospel is not the subjective experience of coming to saving faith. It is the objective truths that uh, we find in the word of God that consist in the gospel. So we are to walk together to defend God's word, to proclaim God's truth, to build up our families and our church according to God's truth. We are to strive together for these things. You know, brother, it's a good word for us because it is easy. You know, I mentioned earlier that, um, you know, the Church of Philippi was a very strong church. Paul really had nothing negative to say about them, but 
they did always have the temptation for toward uh, you know apathy. And again, I think we could all kind of face that ourselves. That uh, that I guess drifting of lukewarmness. We want to be on guard against that. Let's let's by God's grace and power strive together. You know, let's encourage each other. You know, I know that Brother Russell has made some calls encouraging folks who don't normally come on. Wednesdays, especially for the small groups to come, and I'd like to join him in that and encourage you this year to, uh, if you're not normally involved on Wednesday nights and home groups, this would be a great time to uh, to uh, strive together with the church, to join arms together with the church, to join in on that. You know, it's a special time of pray, praying together and getting to know each other. I want to encourage you to be involved with those kinds of things, to strive together for the sake of the gospel. Now, we see Paul addressing uh, the real issue in verse 28, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries. So the church is called to stand firm and to strive together for the faith of the gospel. And here's the context for that, right? And that is struggle. And not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but for you of salvation and that from God. Now, the word frightened here is another one of those vivid word pictures that are so common in the Greek language, but it was a, a word picture that would describe horses. <coughs> horses that maybe became terrified by like a snake or something like that, right? It caused them to, to startle and uh, to jump and maybe to run away. And Paul's saying, don't, don't be that way. Don't be terrified or afraid of your adversaries. I wonder, church, if you ever think about the truth that you have adversaries. When you are for something like we are, when you're for the glory of God, when you're for the truth of God's word, you, you have adversaries. <laughs> because we live in a world that's against the Lord and against his anointed Psalm 2. So listen, you, you have adversaries. You have people who uh, hold completely different positions and worldviews than you have. We have adversaries. Paul's saying, don't be frightened of them. Don't be like that scared horse who's confronted with something that frightens it and startles it and causes it to run away. Don't be surprised, church family, that you have adversaries, but don't be terrified by them. And Paul gives a few reasons why, okay? Not to be terrified by your by adversaries, which is to them <coughs> a proof of perdition. In other words, the sign that they're against the Lord and against his anointed is a sign that they are on the road that leads to destruction. And that's that's the first reason. Don't be terrified of people who are under the wrath of God. And that's the uh, that's the road that they're on. It's a sign for, of, of spiritual death for them to be opposed to God's word and God's truth and God's people. That's a sign of spiritual death. But to you... Of salvation. And so that's the second reason we should not be afraid. It's a sign for us that we are on the narrow way, the way that leads to everlasting life. Of salvation and that from God. By the way, what a beautiful verse of showing God's amazing power and salvation. So we are not to be afraid of our adversaries. We are to stand fast, to stand firm, and not to be afraid. Verse 29, for to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer. <coughs> and um, that's the third uh, characteristic of believers uh, who walk worthy of Christ. We are called, again, to stand fast with each other. We're called to strive together. And then, brethren, we are also called to suffer. And again, you know, as we walk on the narrow way together um, and we realize that there are adversaries, there are those who are against the Lord, against his anointed, against his church, against his truth, against God's gospel. We are also called in that walk on the narrow way to suffer. And, you know, suffering varies from culture to culture and time to time. I mean, we, <laughs> it would be almost ridiculous if we compared ourselves to those believers in, let's say, North Korea, Right. I mean, their calling is uh, extreme. Or maybe in China, 
Or how about places like Iran and other places in the Middle East? So our suffering in comparison to them, <coughs> excuse me, is relatively light. And yet all of those who, who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus, Paul says, will suffer. And so don't be surprised you know, as they walk along the narrow way if there are friends and family who might mock us, if they're non-believers, or if we're rejected by sometimes by our co-workers or others as we walk the narrow way together. That is part of our divine calling. We've been called to salvation and we have been called to suffer for his sake. It is a divine calling, brethren. Do not be surprised when the Lord calls us to suffer. And uh, suffering is part of our calling and those who endure that suffering, that's a sign that we've been truly saved, right? Remember the the four types of soil, and there was one type of soil that when persecution and tribulation came, they fell away. They proved not to be true Christians. They couldn't handle that. They had to be loved by the world. They had to be accepted by the world. It's not the case, of course, with true believers. We recognize the suffering for his sake is part of our divine calling. And that's exactly what Paul says in verse 30, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here is in me. Paul, of course, the prisoner of Christ Jesus. And so, brethren, I would call all of us to be faithful as we walk together through this new year together. I would call all of us to be faithful to our divine calling, to stand fast, right? To lock arms with other believers. Don't, don't try to be a lone ranger. That just never works. We are called to walk together as a church family, to do life together, to pray for each other, to encourage each other. I would call upon all of us to Strive together to work as a unit, as a team, to uh, use our spiritual gifts in the context of the local church and to build up the body of Jesus. I would even call us, as the Lord leads, to suffer for his sake. That is part of being faithful as a follower of Jesus. And I would call upon us not to be terrified by your adversaries. Don't be surprised that there are those who, who uh, you know, reject the Lord and thus they reject you. Don't be surprised by that. Don't be terrified by them. That's a sign of their incoming, <coughs> excuse me, destruction. But it's a sign of your salvation, that the Lord has set his love and affection upon you. Father, we thank you for, <coughs> we thank you for the word of God. We thank you, Lord, that you lead us. We thank you, Lord, that you're honest with us. You, you never leave us um, uh, you never leave us in the dark. You've told us what life would be like as a follower of Jesus. For that, we are very, very thankful. Lord, we pray that you would make us, uh, you'd help us to be faithful this year. We pray, Lord, that if we found ourselves in a lack of discipline as far as reading the scriptures, that you would help us to uh, redouble that this now and and uh, to have a plan for this upcoming year to, to hear and listen to the word of God. We pray that if we, are not being as faithful as we should with gathering um, with the saints in every occasion that we possibly can, that you would help us to uh, to be faithful with that. We pray, Lord, you'd build up this church. And again, Lord, for those who are still sick and, and maybe have sick children or uh, going through a difficult time, we pray your great grace for this body. And uh, pray, Lord, that um, in these coming weeks that our our Sunday mornings will be filled up again and uh, with healthy bodies and uh, that you bless this congregation. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>